weather's kind of yucky. Um, so I appreciate you coming out and digging through the treasures of, of Scripture with me. And we're going to start off with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have to just come outside of the world and sit at your feet and to learn. And Father, I just ask that you would help us to put aside all of the cares and worries and, and, and frustrations and thoughts that are in our everyday life, Father, that we could put those aside right now and that we could focus our full attention on you, Father, on your word and what you have for us. Father, I have no doubt that there is not one person here that you did not bring, Father, and that, that it's no coincidence that, that we are here together as a group. Father, you have planned it, and, and, and I pray for those who have who aren't with us tonight, couldn't be with us, I pray you would watch over them, Father, and bring them back safely on Shabbat to worship. Father, now I just ask that you would open our hearts and our ears of understanding. And Father, that we could shed any pretenses, any preconceived ideas, any pre, um, pre-learned material, Father, anything that we have on us that's baggage, that is not true. So that we can, Father, sit at your feet and hear your words spoken through them. Father, and that we may not only understand them, but we can apply them to our lives. And Father, help us to not let this be rote exercise in learning, but help us to ingest this, Father. Help us that it would change our lives and that we can live it out each day and that it will prepare us for future times. So, Father, I just ask now that you would be with me, Father, and, and that you would just use me and that I would be a vessel in which you could speak, Father, that I would remove myself out of this. And, Father, I just pray that you would get the glory, Father, that the, the, the Ruach HaKadosh, is, as, as he is about this room, Father, would touch hearts. And, Father, that I would just simply be a mechanism to point others to you. And I just thank you for this opportunity, Father. I'm very humble. And now we will just praise you and give you all the glory. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So you know the chart, Daniel, at a glance? So if you'll pull that chart out, because I'm hoping that by now you have figured out you need a little notebook to keep all this in. A three-ring binder's a good thing. There you go. Or one like what Bonnie's got. But you want to keep it all together because we may be over in chapter 8 of Daniel and I'll ask you to pull out something from chapter 2. Um, so it's a good thing to keep it all together. And this chart we're going to pull out every, every time we meet together. So as we look at Daniel at a glance, right, on, in the first chapter you should have something written in. What do you have written in? Somebody's coming. Daniel and friends take them into captivity and they choose not to defile themselves. Okay. All right. Perfect. Does anybody have anything else? Any of the friends that are into the game of church. Okay. Anything else? Daniel and his friends take them into exile by the Babylonians. Israel taken into captivity by Babylon. Okay. All right. All those are excellent. So now, last week we looked at chapter 2. Um, do you remember what chapter 2 was about? What was the main theme of chapter 2? It was a dream. It was a dream. And what was the dream about? A, a statue. Okay, and then we looked at that statue and we talked about Daniel interpreting that dream and talked about what the statue represented and, and how it was really a prophecy for the future. Um, some of it has been fulfilled to this date, some of it has not, and we'll, we'll visit that statue again as we go through the book of Daniel. But so in chapter 2, if you had to say a theme or a title, what would you entitle chapter 2? That was a dream or a dream. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's interpretation. Okay. All right. That's good. Anybody got anything else? Um, let's see. I've got Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue and stone, Daniel and Perkins. I just felt like since the statue was such an important part of chapter 2, I needed to put that in the theme somehow. 
So I, I, that's what I did was the dream of the statue and Daniel's interpretation. But all that, there's no right or wrong, okay? This needs to speak to you, and it needs to bring to your mind, if you're going through the book of Daniel, that you can pull this chart out, and that would r remind you of, okay, this is what chapter 2 is about. Okay. All right, so that's all that we need to have right now. We're not going to fill out anything else yet on this Daniel at a glance. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, you had um, a study guide, Daniel chapter 3, and um, I hope that was helpful to you as you went through um, reading Daniel chapter 3 and, and studying it. I hope that helps you dig into the Word a little bit so that you're a little bit prepared tonight um, that you know a lot of the material and we'll pull it together so that it'll make better sense and, and so we can glean from it. Um, and I pray that you had good prayer time with the Father as you went through the I call it homework, for lack of a better word, as you went through chapter 3. And we'll, we'll go over it a little bit as we go along. Okay, so just to recap, because we're going to focus tonight on the sovereignty of Jehovah. Okay? And we're going to be introduced to El El Yon um, next week. Okay, that means the Most High God. And, and the Most High God of Israel is a sovereign God. He is sovereign over all things. And that's what we dug into this week to just really look at that. Because, you know, we get so used to saying, oh, yeah, he's in control of all things. Everything's under his control, under his power. But have you ever really stopped to dissect that to see exactly what he is in control of? from the big things to the little things? And, and so sometimes, instead of just giving a rote answer that we've heard um, for years and years, we're forced to actually look at Scripture and look and say, just what is he sovereign over? Because when you begin to see that, you begin to see him in a different light. And you begin to see him, as I call it, outside of that box that we grew up putting him in. That he's much larger than that. Um, so we're going to look at his sovereignty in chapter 3. Now, in chapter 1, how did you see Jehovah's sovereignty in chapter 1? How did you see that he was in control? What happened in chapter 1 that showed you that? He gave the king of Yehuda into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was a great king, but he did not do that on his own. The father gave, gave Yehuda the southern kingdom to him. Okay? What else did you see? What else, how else did you see Elohim's sovereignty in chapter 1? You can see it in the Boys, because no other person in the whole kingdom was like Daniel. Yeah. Okay, so he granted them favor, didn't he? And specifically wisdom and the ability for Daniel to interpret dreams, which is very important as you're already beginning to see. So it's his to give. So we see his sovereignty there. What about in chapter 2? How do you see Elohim's sovereignty in chapter 2? We grew up knowing the story. 
Um, but it's more than a story. It's a testimony. Um, and it's very, very real. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control, but Elohim was about to show up and show Nebuchadnezzar just who really is in control. And it's not Nebuchadnezzar, and it's not any earthly man. All right, so as we start into chapter 3, I just want to throw out to you who have or what have you bowed the knee to? Don't answer out loud. In your past life, in your present life, who or what have you bowed the knee to? Who or what have you worshipped in your life? Does Daniel 3 apply to us today? Yes, sir. We know it happened back then, but does it really apply to us today? And that's what we want to glean from this, is how it would apply to us today. All right? Um, does it apply? I'm going to take you to Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon. Because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? Okay? That's future. That hasn't happened yet. And as we go through Daniel, we're going to learn what the beast is and the dragon is and all that. But hold on. But in some time in the future, there is going to be someone that will demand our worship, other than the Most High God of Israel. So, knowing that that's in the future, how do we deal with that? You know, have you ever asked yourself, if I had to take the mark of the beast, what would I do? You know, if, if, if I ever had to bow that, what would I do? Okay? I firmly believe in my heart of hearts that that is the specific reason for Daniel chapter 3. That is why Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah went through this. Not only to achieve showing Nebuchadnezzar who the sovereign God was, not only to, to give them a blessing and show all the nations who they were and people throughout time, but you know, one day, I'm going to go, how am I, I going to do this? And I'm going to remember three boys. And I'm going to remember how they handled it. So it's an example, I think, for us. Not just today, but it's going to be an example that we're going to draw from in the future. And that makes it even more important that we understand it. Okay, um, so you need to understand the principles of Daniel 3 so we can apply them today because idols are not just statues. Idols take different shapes and forms. They can be people, they can be things, um, they can have different appearances. Um, you need to know what you're going to do, what you're going to yield your body to. And you need to understand when you bow down to something, what that really, really means. Because most of us really don't understand that concept. Just like we have a hard time understanding covenants. Sometimes we have a hard time understanding. Well, I'm not really worshiping that. I'm not really bowing down to it. You know, you hear a lot of that. So we're going to try to tease some of that out and see if we can understand. So let's start in chapter 3. In verse 1, um, who, who are we talking about in verse 1? It opens up talking about who? Okay, so what did Nebuchadnezzar, the king, what did he do in the first verse? All right, it says the height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. That's about 90 feet tall and about 9 feet wide. Okay, so that's going to be a lot taller than it is wide. And they, an archaeologist, and I cannot think of his name, they discovered on the plains of Babylon a large brick base that would have been, I mean, huge, that would have supported something that was 90 feet tall and with a small width. It would have had a large base so it could have supported that. Um, and they think most likely that might be what that was. So the base has been discovered. All right, so why do you think the statue is not still there? Scripture doesn't tell us, but what do you think? Okay. It was destroyed. All right. In verse 2, um, well, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. All right. Let me ask you this. Why do you think Nebuchadnezzar set up this statue? You know, we're not told in Scripture why he set it up. We're Pride. just told that he did. Pride. Pride. Any other ideas? Think. Okay, pride, that's a good answer. 
They packed on chapter 2. But they were told him that the father had set him up in the head mm -hmm. of the statue and he wanted to kind of just throw his stuff and pray. Okay. So he not only made a head of gold, he made a whole statue that was gold. So if the head of gold was just to be, if the head was just to be gold, and then that's your kingdom, but then guess what? Then you have the breast of silver that's going to take over the head of gold. But what if I'm just going to make my whole statue go? What does that say? My kingdom's forever. He made the whole statue go. Okay? So maybe he was in rebellion to the interpretation of that dream. Um, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Uh, I think the head of gold went to his head, actually. And, um, you know, in chapter 2, we see that Nebuchadnezzar recognizes Daniel's God as the Most High God, but he's not accepted in his, his God, and he is running, and he's in rebellion. Okay, So out of rebellion, he possibly could have built this whole statue of gold um, just to say that he was going to have the last say, and his kingdom would last forever. All right, then in verse 2, he arranges for the dedication of this image or this idol, the statue, and he calls the rulers to come. He says, um, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Okay, so does anybody know what these different people are? I, I, I looked up, um, satraps were like provincial officers. Uh, prefects, chief officers, or magistrates, or governors. So basically, as you see this litany of the people he called, just about everybody in his service. I, I, I'm not familiar with exactly the hierarchy of the Babylonian government, but it looks like he called all of the ones that were in charge. Okay? All of his officials he called um, to worship this statue. Um, so they all came in verse 3. Um, it says, Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All right. Tell me in verse 4 what was demanded once they were there and they were before this statue, completely gold of Nebuchadnezzar. What did, what did, what did um, the herald proclaim? What were they to do? Praise and a loud voice. Okay. Let's take it straight from Scripture. What were they told to do? Exactly. It says, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. Okay. Remember, Babylonian province was huge. And it says, At that moment that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, or lyre, I guess it's lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, which is a stringed instrument um, in the zither family, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and do what? Worship. You are to fall down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Okay? So when they hear all of this going on, the music or whatever, they're to stop what they're doing, they're to bow down and they're to worship this graven image of Nebuchadnezzar. So there are two words, um, and, and Jessica and I were talking about that this week. There's two words in Hebrew for worship. One of them is shakah, and we see that in Genesis 24, 6, and Psalm 6, 7. And it means to bow down, to prostrate oneself out of respect, to give allegiance to. The other word is avad, and we see that in Genesis 2, 5, and 29, 15, and it means to serve. It's not just the outward act of bowing down, but it's saying that you will serve whatever it is that you're bowing down to. Okay? So it's, it's, it's actually got more than one part to it. The English word for worship is worth-ship. That means um, looking at someone's value and treating them according to that value. Okay? You see someone's value, someone's worth, and you're going to treat them according to what that worth is. Okay. So when you see the word worship, it's more than just 
an act of bowing down. Okay? It means a lot more to it. Whether you acknowledge that it means more or not, okay? It means more. Okay? Now, the act of bowing down in worshiping, before we talk about idols or go any further, let's look at what Yeshua says about worship. Um, now, will you turn to Luke 14, 25, and 28? Kamari, will you do Matthew 10, 17 through 22? Don, will you do 10, 32 through 39? And Holly, will you do Matthew 22, 36 through 40? And we're going to read these really quickly, but I think it's really important because. You know, of course, we're, we're going to go by what our Father in Heaven says, and His Son, the Messiah, spoke everything the Father says, so we want to see what the Son says. I'm going to go over again. Dale, Luke 14, 25, and 28. Kamari, 10, Matthew 10, 17 through 22. Don, Matthew 10, 32 through 39. And then Holly, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Just, they don't have to be in that order. Go ahead. Uh, Luke 14, 25 through 28. Okay. A large crowd were going with him and turning. He said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and his own life too, he is unable to be my tall one. And whosoever does not bear his stake and come after me is unable to be my tall one. For whom of you wishing to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost for that has enough for that he has enough to complete it? Okay. So Yeshua is saying, is there anything that should you should give more allegiance to than him? He says you're to leave anything and everything to follow him. Okay. He is to be your allegiance. He is worthy of your worship. And don't let anything get in the way of that. Okay? But beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to the same evil, with all you in your congregations. And you shall be brought before government with sovereigns for my sake, as a witness to them and to the nations. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it shall be given to you in that hour when you shall speak. For it is not you who speak. For the spirit of your father speaking in you, and brother shall, and brother shall deliver of brother to them, and the father his child, and children shall rise up against parents, and shall put them to death, and you shall be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. Okay. All right, what about Matthew 10, 32 through 39? Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him I shall also confess before my Father, who is in the heavens. But whoever shall deny me before men, him I shall also deny before my Father, who is in the heavens. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to bring divisions. A man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies are those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it, and he that has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Does he say not to love your family, your no, mother, no. your father? No. no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying do not love them more than him. Do not put anything ahead of the father. Do not put anything ahead of the son. Okay. All right. What about Matthew 22, 36-40? Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? 
Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what do you love first? First and foremost. Your father. Your heavenly father. And so if you love it first, it can never be second, right? But we as humans tend to do that. And he's saying, no, that's not what we do. That's not what you do. So Yeshua speaks to, you know what? The Father deserves allegiance only. No man, no statue, no anything. Not even family. Not even the things that we put right up there and we elevate high on these pedestals. And it may be people. It may be possessions. It may be your job. It may be accomplishments. It, you, it's just endless. But you can fill in the blanks. And that's what I want you to do in your private prayer time is fill in the blanks and say, Father, show me where my heart's divided, where I am not worshiping you completely, or where I am putting something above you on any given day at any given time. Because you can't cheat and say things like, well, most of the time. No. It's got to be all the time. All right, so so Yeshua demands our allegiance, the five, and, and the Father demands our allegiance. All right, so worship is a matter of really three things as I'm looking at this. It's a matter of your mind because you have to look at something and you have to make the decision or consider if it's worthy, okay? Then the emotions because you know what? When you worship something, you adore it. Okay, can you really worship something and not adore it? Because it, it grabs your heart. Your heart is what's in the whole worship. Um, and the will, because worship leads to an action. An act based on your respect or your adoration. Okay? Whether it's breaking Torah, bowing down, um, whatever it is, it's going to lead to an action. So worship is kind of a serious thing. It is giving the Father the respect and the worth that he deserves. Okay. Alright, so let's go on in verse 6. Does anybody have anything else to say about worship? Okay. In verse 6, there's a contrast here. Do you see what the contrast is? There's the word but. What is being contrasted here? He says that when you hear all these things, you're to fall down and worship, but whomever doesn't fall down, okay, see the contrast? So it's contrasting the falling down and worshiping versus the not falling down to worship. So there's a consequence here if you don't fall down and worship this huge statue. And what was the consequence? Going into a burning fiery furnace. Okay. Yeah. Um, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into this furnace. And that was, remember how I told you Nebuchadnezzar liked the whole thing of tearing from limb to limb? That was one of his favorite ways to torture or kill people. And the second one that he was known for was the, the burning people alive thing. And he had mounds set up. And it had a hole in the top of the mound. And then it had a ramp going up. And then there was, out, there was cut out of the side of the mound. And then he had his regalia set up with his chairs. And it had his canopy and all this so he could sit in comfort and watch people being burned alive. He, he gained great satisfaction from that. So he says, okay. You know, bow down and worship, but if you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. All right, so in verse 7, what happened because of that? When all the people heard the sounds of all the instruments, okay, and yeah, it says in, in verse 8, it says, For this reason at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. Right? Why do you think they did that? Jealousy. Jealousy. They were jealous of them. Okay. The other thing that we have to recognize is that Hasatan has always hated the Jewish people. The nation of Israel. Why is that? They were the favorite Jews. Okay. Why else? They obeyed him. They obeyed him. What else? They had the oracles of God. They had the oracles of God. What else? The seed would come through them. The Savior. And you know what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were just Jewish slaves. And now they have been elevated to these high positions. So yeah, they were jealous of these guys. All right? 
So he says um, in verse 8, For this reason they brought charges. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. And in verse 10 and 11, they just basically remind him of his decree. You know, it's kind of like, I'm going to remind you what you said, just in case you forgot, so you won't go back on it. You yourself, O king, have made a decree that every man hears the sound of the horn, the flute, lyre, trigon, stalti, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever doesn't fall down shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. All right, Brooke, did everyone bow down? No. Nope. No. All right, in chapter, I mean, in verse 12, there are certain Jews who you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at chapter 2, verse 49. And somebody read that. Chapter 2, verse 49. He named the last of his and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, holy the work of the province of Baal and Daniel in the midst of the salt. So Daniel was serving the king at court, all right, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were out in the province at, um, being administrators and being over the provinces. So they would have been out on the plain of Dura. And it says that um, there were certain Jews that you've appointed over the administration, namely these guys, who these men, O king, have disregarded you, and they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. On your homework, I ask you, um, I think it's number four, why do you, wait, no, 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 we're not there yet, hang on. Let me ask you this, why do you think they refuse to bow down and worship? Because they wouldn't they got. Okay. Right yeah, it's like number five, I think, on your homework. That is not Okay. All right, so let me ask you this. Look at Exodus 21 through 5. Did you do that on your homework? Mm -hmm. What is what does it say in Exodus 20? You shall what? You shall have no other gods before me. Did the three boys know that? Okay, they knew Torah, they were raised with Torah, they, they had purposed in their heart to obey. Um, then in Deuteronomy 4, he tells them, uh, Moshe's reminding the people, do not act corruptly and make graven images, lest you be drawn away and worship them and serve them. Why? Because your Elohim is a jealous one. So they would have known Deuteronomy. And not speak of the covenant. Alright, and then... Um, so, Yomavah, he had plans for them. Um, he, they knew that they had received commandments that they needed to obey to set them apart, to show the nations um, the God of Israel. Right? And how do you show other people, other nations, your God? By being set apart. How do you be set apart? In obedience. It's a reflection of him. And you're, you're like him. And, and so these three boys would have known that. So they didn't bow down. All right? And then in Ezekiel 23, there's an allegory about two sisters. Did you read that? It's, it's really, really a good allegory. All right? Who were the two sisters that played the harlot? Israel and Judah. Israel was the northern kingdom. And Yehuda, Judah, was the southern kingdom. All right? And it's interesting. Did you make a list? Did anybody make a list of what they learned about these two sisters or these two kingdoms? It's very helpful if you do that. Um, the northern kingdom, let me just recap for you. The northern kingdom, which is Israel. Um, their idolatry went all the way back to Egypt. Okay? They played the harlot in Egypt um, in their youth. They're the elder sister. They belong to Elohim. They bore sons and daughters. Samaria is her name. I'm just taking it straight out of the scriptures. They played the harlot while belonging to Elohim. They lusted after their neighbors, the Assyrians. They bestowed her hollow trees on the Assyrians. They defiled herself with their idols. They were given to her hand. They were given to the hands of her lovers, the Assyrians. Assyria uncovered her nakedness, took her sons and daughters. Um, slew her with a sword, and she became a byword among women. Assyria executed judgments on her. So the northern kingdom disobeyed, um, and they put gods, other gods, before the one God of Israel. And the result of this idol worship was 
that Elohim gave them into the Assyrians' hands in 722 BCE. And in the southern kingdom, after this, Played the harlot in Egypt as well, belonged to Elohim, bore sons and daughters. Jerusalem is her name. She saw what happened to her sister in the northern kingdom, yet she was more corrupt in lust and harlotries, lusted after the Babylonians. Babylonians defiled her on her bed with their harlotry, and when defiled by Babylonians, became disgusted with them, uncovered her nakedness and harlotries. Elohim became disgusted with her, multiplied her harlotries, Elohim issued judgment against her by bringing her lovers against her as enemies, which were the Babylonians, and said, They will judge you according to their customs. They will deal with you in wrath. Do you see the wrath? Do you see Babel? Do you see what Nebuchadnezzar is doing? Sons and daughters were taken, survivors consumed by fire, clothes and jewels taken away. They will be given into the hands of those whom you hate. And were alienated, they will deal with you in hatred and take all your property. They will leave you bare. And why the judgment? They forgot Elohim. They cast Elohim behind their back. They committed adultery. There was blood on their hands. They committed adultery with idols and sacrificed their children to idols. They profaned God's sanctuary and they defiled themselves with idols. And what was the result? Elohim brought Babylon against them and took the second sister away. So while it's an allegory of two sisters, it's the story of two kingdoms. So you can see how they were taken into captivity because they did what? They worshipped idols. Okay. And I ask you a question. Out of Ezekiel 6, 9, how does idolatry affect Jehovah? And how does it affect the one who is the idolater? You know, that was one of the first times it was revealed to my heart that, you know, you say, oh, well, you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, but I never realized that such a most high God could be hurt. I mean, that's an emotion. It could be hurt by something that I do. But Scripture says, Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations to which they will be carried captive. How I have been hurt by their adulterous hearts which turned away from me, and by their eyes, which played the harlot after their idols. And they will loathe themselves in their own sight. It goes on. So, adulterous hearts hurt Jehovah. Now, can I ask the question, on a, according to Scripture, is spiritual adultery and idolatry the same? Yes. It's putting something else before the Most High God of Israel. Who are you giving your heart to? Who are you giving your allegiance?